watching online or in the overflow room or on one of our campuses or right here in the Crown Ridge Auditorium, we want to welcome you. We're so grateful that you're here. Each week we pause as we begin the message and offer a prayer on behalf of one of our partner churches. Several churches in San Antonio and South Texas are partnering with us as we study through this topical Bible, Believe, looking at the 30 big ideas. And this week, we're looking at the idea of joy, and we're happy and joyful to be praying for this great church, Curry Creek Church, John Free, great senior pastor. Let's join our hearts and pray for this sister congregation. Lord, we offer a prayer of blessing upon the Curry Creek Church that you would bless them as they minister to people in the area of Bernie and around the hill country. Strengthen Pastor John as he brings the word and leads the flock. Forgive our speaker today. His sins are many and help us to see Jesus, just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. So we are continuing our study of the big ideas of the Bible, turning the chapter to the chapter of joy. Desperately needed topic, wouldn't you agree? Since we're discussing the theme of joy, I thought it'd be appropriate to assemble some experts and let them give their testimonies. it about the joy of a baby that causes us so much happiness? Did you see how contagious that was? You should have seen your faces. <laughs> how long has it been since you felt that level of joy? Maybe you say, oh, I feel that all the time. If so, God bless you. For the rest of us, what happened? Where did it go? You might think, I, I used to feel that level of joy, but then life took its toll. The disease took my health. The economy took my job. The affair took my marriage. The jerk took my heart. And I lost my joy. Joy seems like such a fragile thing, doesn't it? It's like a cloud that's here one day and then blown away the next. Still, we keep searching for it. Have you ever noticed how marketing companies know that all of us want joy? Every commercial, every advertisement promises joy. It's not hard to be in marketing anymore because drive our car, you'll be happy. That's all you do. Wear this dress, you'll find joy. Use our hand cream, you'll find joy. Everything promises joy. I even saw a Preparation H commercial. (laughs) Before, the guy had no joy. Afterwards, he had a joy-filled face. (laughs) Everyone promises joy. But who delivers? Who delivers? Maybe you've heard the joke about the fellow who was trying to assemble the pieces of of a jigsaw puzzle. He just couldn't get it to work. He called up a friend. He said, Bob, I know you're great with jigsaw puzzles. Would you come over here and help me? And and Bob said, well, does the jigsaw puzzle, is is there a cover? Is there a picture on the box? And the guy said, yeah. Well, what's the picture? He said, it's a picture of a tiger. And Bob said, you mean you can't get all those pieces together to make it look like that tiger? And the guy said, no, way, I cannot. No matter what I do, I can't get, this, get, get all the pieces to come together. So Bob said, okay, I'll, I'll come over. He drove over and he walked in the house and walked in the room where all the pieces were scattered on the table. And Bob looked at his friend. He said, well, I got two things to say to you. Number one, I'll never be able, and you'll never be able, to get these pieces to look like that tiger. And number two, put these frosted flakes back in the box. (laughs) We're trying to get the pieces to fit. And when it comes to joy, 
it seems like they just don't fit. And they don't look like the picture of joy that we have in mind. It might surprise you to know that God is interested in you having joy. Just like a father would want his children to be happy. God wants you to be happy. That might surprise you. Many people assume that being a Christian means being grim or being solemn or even being sad. But I believe that God longs for us to experience a deep seated, heavenly rooted joy. The question of this weekend is a real relevant one. It's on page 353 in your Believe book, and it's this. What gives true happiness and contentment in life? What does? And the answer according to the Bible is this. Despite my circumstances, I feel inner contentment, and I understand my purpose in life. Let's be clear. The, the joy that, that God promises is not the same joy promised at the, at the shopping mall or, or in the shopping catalog. God is not interested in putting a temporary smile on your face, but he's very interested in depositing a wellspring of joy in your heart. He has no interest in giving you a, a shallow joy that melts at the first sign of adversity, but he is very interested in giving you a joy that's anchored to something, better said, someone greater than yourself. So this joy will last as long as you do. The joy that God offers to us is a a mixture of peace and, and hope and belief. It's not just a silly smirk that you see a, a religious, shallow, praise the Lord anyway attitude that, that has no depth to it. No, the, the joy of Jesus is authentic. It, it, sometimes it causes you to smile on the outside, but it always causes you to smile on the inside. It creates a sense of, of peace. It doesn't pretend there is no trouble in the world. The joy of Jesus is not naivete, and it's really not levity. The joy of Jesus still weeps at funerals. The joy of Jesus still sighs at the sight of disease. The joy of Jesus still winces at the appearance of injustice and still flinches at the presence of evil. But the joy of Jesus It just doesn't throw in the towel. It doesn't give up. It's a deep-rooted, deep-seated, heaven-based belief that there is a good God, and this good God has a good plan. And this joy that emerges is something that impacts and infects every part of our lives. But this is the joy that's promised by Jesus. Look at this promise. He said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. See, our joy is incomplete, but Jesus promises to put his joy inside of us and complete our joy. This is a lifelong process, but the longer Christ is in us and the more we lean into him, the consequence is more joy. Now, that's a pretty good offer, don't you think? Wouldn't you love to discover increasing levels of joy every day of your life? And this is a joy that comes from Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul, excuse me, calls joy a fruit of the Holy Spirit. When you look at the fruits of the Holy Spirit, this is fruit number two. The first one we looked at last week. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and then joy. And then there are several others. But joy happens as a consequence of being attached to the Holy Spirit. If an orange tree doesn't bear oranges, the orange tree doesn't just grimace and say, I've got to produce an orange, I've got to produce an orange. Something is wrong in the connection of the orange tree to the source of nutrients. And if you're going long periods of time without joy, The solution is not to say, I've got to be happy. I've got to be happy. If it kills me, I'm going to be happy. The the, the solution is to check your connection to Christ. If joy is indeed a supernatural gift of God, 
then joy happens as our relationship with God is strengthened and grows. Joy is a natural consequence of being connected with Christ. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it is a fruit that God longs for us to have. The Apostle Peter talks about this fruit of joy when he wrote his epistle. And this passage is, is on page 367 in your Believe book if you want to read it. Or it's in First Peter chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. And Peter says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Speaking of Jesus. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Look at this inexpressible joy of Jesus. I would suggest to you that first of all, this joy is a courageous joy. It's a courageous joy. These people were faced with difficult circumstances. Look at their circumstances. Paul was writing God's chosen people who are away from their homes and are scattered around the countries of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These were persecuted Christians. They had been scattered. They had been driven from their homes. They had lost their Home, homeland. They had lost their houses. They had lost their possessions. They had lost their opportunity to be with their family. But they had never lost their joy. Though their circumstances were difficult, their joy was real. Why? Peter says, I'm, I'm reading from a different translation. He said, you have never seen Jesus and you don't see him now, but you love him and have faith in him. Hmm. They had lost everything, but they had not lost their joy because they had not lost their Christ. They had lost everything, but they had not lost their joy because they had not lost their Christ. What about you? What has been taken from you? Your health? Your scholarship? Your future? Your house? Your career? Your friends, maybe you've buried someone you love. When you buried someone you love, did you bury your joy at the same time? Life gets difficult. And sometimes it's a challenge to hang on to our joy. But one reason joy can slip away is because we substitute this courageous joy for a contingent joy. Contingent joy says, I'll be happy if, or I'll have joy as long, or if only I had that, I would have joy. If we could get a new house, I'd have joy, or if I could get a new spouse, I'd have joy, (laughs) or if I were healthy again, if I could be healed. Many times these are legitimate desires. But we're banking on joy happening if something happens. This is called contingent joy. It's not courageous joy. Contingent joy depends upon the right circumstances. Courageous joy depends upon the presence of Christ. Now, the problem with contingent joy is that we can't control circumstances, right? The problem with contingent joy is we cannot control circumstances. So if your joy depends upon a circumstance, well, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. I remember when I was in college, I met this girl I knew my mom would love. So I took her home to meet my mom and mom didn't like her. So I took her back. (laughs) I met another girl. I knew mom would love her. So I took her home to meet my mom. Mom didn't like her, so I took her back. This went on for several months. I went through a dormitory full of girls. <laughs> Finally, I met a girl I knew my mom would love. She looked just like my mom. She thought just like my mom. She sounded just like my mom. So I took her home, and my dad couldn't stand her, so I, I took her back. <laughs> Thank you. 
You see, you can't control how people respond, can you? And as long as you're thinking, I can control how somebody responds to me, or I can fix somebody, or if I can get this circumstance the way I want it, then I will have joy. If you'd allow me to be so bold, I'll just say, you're setting yourself up for a sour life. You're setting yourself up for a sour life. You ever wonder why some people, when they get to my age, they look so sour? (laughs) It's because they have been disappointed and disappointed and disappointed and disappointed because they've bought into the lie of contingent joy. Early in their life, somebody said, now you'll be happy if you own that car. And they bought that car and they were happy, but then the car got old. They got the idea of, I could be happy if I could marry that person. They married that person. That person couldn't bring them joy. They bought into the idea that if I could just get that career, get that business, we could elect that president. (laughs) If we could do that, then joy would come. And consequently, they get there only to be what? Disappointed, let down, disappointed, let down, disappointed, let down. And by the time they get to my age, they're they're gun shy. I'm not going to be disappointed again. And their hearts get hard because they fear that they're going to be disappointed again. Now contrast that person with a person who early in their life says, you know what? I'm going to build my joy on Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust him to forgive my sins. I'm going to welcome the Holy Spirit into my life. I'm going to build my life upon the promises of God, not the circumstances of life. I'm going to build my life upon God's promises. And I'm going to make it my aim. My aim is to know him. I know there's going to be challenges. I know there's going to be difficulties. I know I can't control everybody and I can't fix everything. But as much as as I can, with God being my helper, my goal is to know him. I'll tell you one thing, when that person gets to be my age, they're going to glow. That scowl is going to be gone. But they're going to glow, not because they have been free from problems or, or difficulties, just the opposite. Just like anyone else, they've had their share. But what they have had is a hope, a security. They've anchored their expectations to God. And their expectations have not been dashed. And just the opposite. They found that every time they seek to find God, they find more of God. And he's increasingly beautiful. And his grace never ends. And his mystery of love is unfathomable. And they find themselves literally walking in this Yosemite forest of God's goodness. Every step unveils something else. And they realize it's going to take an eternity to know this God. So they're not disappointed. And consequently, they have joy. Now, let me say it again. I'm not talking about some fake joy that pretends there is no problem or pain in the world. But a sincere joy, it's ballistic. It refu- it's, it's weatherproof. It gets wet, but it doesn't sink. It's a joy that can weather the storms and the struggles of life. And that's the kind of joy that Jesus had, and that's the kind of joy that Jesus offers. Here it is in a sentence. Contingent joy depends upon circumstances. Courageous joy depends upon Christ. So if your joy is dependent upon circumstances, you'll set yourself up for disappointment. But if your joy depends upon Christ, you'll never be devastated. You may struggle, but you'll never be devastated. Can death take your joy? Well, no, because Jesus is greater than death. Can failure take your joy? No, because God's grace is sufficient for all of our sins. Can betrayal take your joy? Well, no, because God has promised that he would be with you even when people are not. Can disappointment take your joy? It'll try. (laughs) But it can't take it because when you're disappointed and your world, the world doesn't turn out the way you planned, you'll realize, but God is sovereign and his plan is greater than mine. You have these tools with which you can deal with the challenge of life. Jesus gave you this promise. It's an astounding promise. No one will take away your joy. Isn't that great? You can stand on that today and say, well, all right. It's possible for me to have a joy that's going to outlive my life. 
And my joy can increase. No one can take it away. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. You'll have sadness, you'll have grief, but Jesus promised even your grief will turn into joy. This is courageous joy. And you know what happens? If you were to surrender your contingent joy and move into courageous joy, that courageous joy becomes, hang on to your hats, contagious joy. Aren't I clever? (laughs) Contagious joy. You develop a case of joy that causes people to pick it up. You're infectious. He's suffering from a case of joy, and I think I picked some up off of him. It's a contagious joy. It causes the joy level of your house and your neighborhood and your workplace to increase. How many of you think our world could use a little more joy? How many of you have ever been on an airplane full of grumpy people? (laughs) How many of you have ever been in a workplace where nobody wants to be there? Don't you appreciate somebody who just, who doesn't seem sucked in to the quicksand of despair and who has found a way to radiate some joy, to at least be a candle in a dark, dark world. I believe you'd like to be that person. I know I would. This is the kind of joy that was seen in the New Testament church. The scripture says about the New Testament Christians, the first Christians, they ate together in their homes, happy to share their food with joyful hearts. Look at that, joyful hearts. They praised God, and I love this, they were liked by all people. Sometimes I think we're beginning to think that being a Christian means being grim or being angry or being perpetually ticked off sour, victimized. But here the first Christians were liked by all people. Mm. May God bring that about today. May God create within us a spirit of joy that is so contagious and so infectious that we are liked by all people. I'm real excited about our new sanctuaries that we're building in the Outer West and at Crown Ridge. I'm really thankful about the new campuses we're developing. I'm really grateful for our programs. I think we're right on track. But can I just say, new buildings, new programs, and preachers will not change the world. Right? I mean, there's a European continent full of wonderful buildings. But many of those cathedrals are empty of joy. Doesn't do anything to build a beautiful sanctuary. What changes the world are joyful people. Joyful people. I want to enlist you to be a person of joy. To catch a case of joy. To bring contagious joy into your workplace. I close with three ideas. A, B, C. The A, B, C's of joy. First, would you assess your joy level? Just take a look. Take your pulse. Take your joy pulse. Maybe, maybe you're hearing this message and saying, you know what? I think you're right, Max. I, I've settled into a case of the doldrums. And it's been a while since I had some joy. And I realize I'm speaking to some of you for whom joy is a forgotten emotion. Because you battle what may be the most difficult of mental conditions. You battle depression. And I'm not wanting to make light of it. And I'm not wanting to say that you do this and immediately it's going to disappear. I've found in working with people that depression is a real struggle. We, in our own family, have experienced depression. If you've ever heard my wife, Deanlin, tell her story, she'll tell you about the season in her life in which every day seemed dark. There seemed to be a gray cloud over her and her attitude no matter what. Our children were small, kindergarten, kindergarten, diapers. And I was traveling way too much, leaving her with a lot of responsibilities. 
And this cloud of sadness just seemed to settle over her. That's hard for anybody. It's especially hard if you're the preacher's wife, right? But Deanlin, to her credit, has never been one to put on a make-believe face. And so one Sunday, she just decided she was going to shoot straight with people. This has been many years. It wasn't at this building. It was at a different one. But she showed up for church one Sunday, resolved, all right, you ask me how I'm doing, I'm going to tell you. I was already at the building, so she got the three girls out of the car and was walking them all up to the church building. And a lady came up to the first unsuspecting victim came up to her. (laughs) Said, Deanlin, how are you doing? And Deanlin said, I'm sad, I'm depressed, I need some help. That turned into a very meaningful conversation. The next person Deanlin saw said, Deanlin, how are you doing? She said, well, you know, to be honest, I'm not doing well. I'm sad, I'm depressed, I need some help. That turned into a meaningful conversation. This went on all morning. By the end of the day... Deanlin had had more than a dozen heartfelt conversations with people she found surprisingly sympathetic. In fact, a couple, maybe three or four, said, I've been down that road. I know what it's like to be a young mom. Here's what I did. Here's here's what helped me. Now, Deanlin, I'm telling this story with her permission, would say, I wasn't healed that day, but my healing began that day. And I think what happened is she began to see that joy was an option. We can get so overwhelmed by sadness that we assume that sadness is our new normal, right? That's why after you assess your joy level, I think it's important to be, believe that joy is possible. (laughs) Believe that joy is possible. Believe that joy is an option. Don't get sucked in to sadness. Defy despair. Stand up against it. Say, well, all right. I know I'm not where I should be, but I believe that God is greater, and I'm going to stand on his promises. He has promised that he's going to put joy in my heart. He has said that joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. I've said yes to Jesus. He's in my heart. I'm being led and I'm indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So I believe that joy is going to happen. This is a storm. It's a tough time, but storms always end. And I'm looking toward the day that my joy is restored. King David once prayed, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And God will do the same for you. Would you believe that? Then lastly, just call out to God. Call out to God. Again, if joy is indeed a fruit of the Holy Spirit, and if you are a child of God, and if he desires that you have joy, then doesn't it make sense that you ask him, he's going to give it? Call out to your heavenly Father. Believe this. He loves you. He loves you. And he's got a great plan for you. And there's a real devil, and that devil wants to take your joy. So you call out to Christ, and you just expect and believe by faith that prayer is going to be answered. Amen? Contingent, courageous, contagious. May you move from contingent joy into contagious joy. Thank you, Lord, for your teaching, for this promise that we're so hungry to receive. We bless you now in Jesus' name. And all the church said, Amen.